Okay, so that answers my first question. <laughs> Scar. <laughs> 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 um, so how many people how many people use our gift? In in Agna, actually in their day job. <laughs> For those hands going to be And uh, how many people use Dotnet? Yeah. Oh, more. Oh, that's good. Okay. Um, so a little bit about me before we start. Uh, I'm a software developer and a consultant. Uh, I'm co-founder of a company called Network Planet. We've been doing semantic web-related stuff for uh, 10 years. Um, uh, as part of Network Planet, I was a co-creator of Brightstar DB, uh, which is an open source for the store for .NET. Uh, I've been programming in .NET since 2004, since we started the company. So, uh, seeing as I get an opportunity to plug, I'm going to uh, plug my open source project for a slide or two, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about things that are more general, uh, about data binding RDF, um, about using uh, language integrated query, which is a part of .NET uh, for Spark queries, uh, and if I get chance, though I just realised yesterday that I only have 30 minutes and not 45, uh, we'll talk about own data and Sparkle interoperability. Um, we may not get there, we'll see. So, uh, plug for Brightstar DB, um, it is an open source MIT licensed uh, triple store for .NET. Uh, and when I say .NET, we're aiming to do all of .NET, um, though not compact framework. Um, so, classic .NET, uh, mono, uh, which means also working with Xamarin stuff, so we can run portable class libraries on Android, iOS, Windows Phone. Um, so, we're actually aiming to be not a big triple store, like most triple stores, Try to be in not to do a billion triple challenge in half an hour. Uh, we're actually trying to be an embeddable uh, triple store that you can use in applications that run on mobile devices and on tablets. Uh, having said that, uh, as well as our embedded API, we do also have a uh, REST based server um, using the awesome Nancy framework, uh, which is uh, a kind of part of a Ruby framework and just works really nicely, much better than ASP. Um, so yeah, so we're aiming to basically do uh, RDF, do Sparkle, uh, have a very small footprint, be very easy to deploy, easy to deploy upgrades and so on and so forth. If you want to check it out, there is a website, of course. So uh, let's talk a bit about um, RDF data binding. To start with, um, anybody, have you heard of these phrases, open world assumption, closed world assumption? Okay, I'll explain just very briefly. Um, the open world assumption basically states that um, if you don't know something to be true, then that only, only can tell you that you don't know it. Um, you can't assume it to be false. Whereas in a closed world model, if you don't, if you know, if you don't know something to be true, you assume it's false. So you close down uh, the scope of your model. Um, RDF has an open world assumption, uh, and this is because it's built for the web. Uh, and that's the only way in which you can scale out to the web. You, know, you have partial, have to work with the fact that you're going to always have partial knowledge. Um, nice thing about open world models is that they basically they scale better, they allow you to do data integration much more easily uh, between, uh, between different, um, uh, different models, different viewpoints of the world. Um, and they also allow for easier ongoing data migration as you want to expand or refine your model. And it's much more easy to do that uh, if you haven't closed it down into a particular uh, closed world model. However, closed world models are basically what we use in programming, right? Whenever we write a set of classes or interfaces uh, and go about it, except of course in your know, fancy programming languages. Um, most programming languages, you end up with a closed world model, you just define some, uh, some classes and interfaces. And we do that for a lot of reasons. Basically, because it makes our job easier as programmers. It makes it much easier to reason about a closed world model. Um, it's much easier for us to think about our how we relate to the outside world, but because we've got a simplified model of it. Um, and I think also the, the fact is that even if you do have a system that allows you to build an open world set of assumptions, once you get down to a certain layer in almost any application, you make a commitment to some kind of model. Uh, whether that is right down at the presentation layer where you've got a form that you display to the, to the user that they have to fill in, um, or at the data access layer, which is typically where those kind of things happen. So, if we accept that an open world assumption is a good thing to have, uh, and that it helps us to do uh, to scale our data and to integrate better with other data sources, but we also know that we have to have 
closed world models in order to work with our programming languages, or it helps us to reason about things. Uh, is there a way in which we can combine these two things? And I believe there is. Uh, and that is by treating every closed world model that we develop as simply a view on top of an open world model. Okay? So we can have a number of different views, which are all just partial, um, if you like, microscopic uh, slices of the open world that we're taking that just fit our particular domain, our particular problem that we want to solve at that particular moment. And there's no reason why these views can't overlap and share data between them. So we set out in uh, Brightstar DB, having built the triple store, uh, you know, first day we built the triple store, thought, oh, that was easy. So what should we do now? Um, so we decided that we wanted to be able to provide some way of being able to uh, translate this open world model into the closed world C sharp uh, model. So we took an approach to binding is actually RDF data to uh, C sharp instances, uh, and it's, this is pretty much the way in which you imagine you would do it. Um, you take all of your uh, classes uh, and bind them to uh, RDF type of something. Uh, just doing that makes it easy to find all of the instances of those classes. The nice thing about RDF is that a resource can have multiple types. Um, so we can, we can have one resource with multiple views onto it, each calling it a different kind of thing. Um, you do need to have some kind of way of, uh, of generating identifiers for your instances, um, and then you need to convert those into URIs because that's the way you're going to work with them in RDF. Um, but just have a prefix and then just slap the ID on the end of it. <coughs> uh, that does mean then that your applications do have some kind of, there is a connection between them because they've all got to use the same addressing scheme. Um, but that's kind of a small price to pay, I think. Uh, and then uh, you've got properties uh, of classes that will bind to RDF literal properties, and you've got relations uh, that bind to RDF resource properties. It's really easy, so it's straightforward stuff. The approach we take in Brightstar DB is uh, to do a co-generation co model, uh, where you define a contract first, which is just a set of interfaces. Um, and this is the simplest way, the, this is the very simplest sort of uh, uh, decorated interface that you can have. You basically write out your interface, you put the uh, properties that you want to have on it, uh, and then you just slap this entity attribute on the top. If you're not familiar with C-sharp, which is most of the room, um, this square bracket notation at the top is just a, it's a decoration uh, on top of, in this case, on top of the interface. You can also put more properties as well. Um, and that can be inspected. Uh, and our code generation with respect and generates an implementation of this class. So, <coughs> so uh, the, basically, once you've got this, um, this custom class generation, the uh, custom class generated, it contains all of the information necessary to do the data binding. So, in this very simple example, you would end up with RDF resources getting an RDF type with a generated URI based on the name of the, of the interface. Um, by convention, anything that's called ID gets used to store the, the key, uh, which is like the last bit of the URI that we're going to uh, append onto the, onto the URI prefix, or the URI pre prefix is predefined in this case. Um, then we've got a literal property here, uh, which will just get uh, turned into an RDF property, again with a, a URI generated based on the name of the property, in this case name. Uh, and we've got a relation property as well, uh, which is a collection in this case, uh, and that will just get uh, converted into an uh, RDF resource. Of course, most of the time you want to have a bit more control over, over things than that, so there are uh, a plethora of different ways you can uh, do annotations. So, at the global level within your application, at the assembly level, um, you can uh, predefine some, some prefixes that just make it uh, a little bit easier to write the rest of the attributes as you, as you go down. So this one here, this says that actually uh, I want the type of RDF resource that you generate to be a both person. Uh, down here we're saying uh, uh, that this particular attribute, this is going to be our, our uh, primary key, if you like, for the resource, uh, and I want you to generate a URI by taking the ID value and appending it to example.com slash person slash ID. And then we've got some properties and we're actually telling uh, the code generator what, uh, what URIs we want to use for those uh, predicates. And uh, this one at the bottom, this is uh, telling me that uh, obviously when you're generating these properties, 
These are all going in the um, sort of the traditional subject predicate object. So the subject would be the instance of the other person in the face that you've got, uh, the predicate would be the folk name, and then the value would be whatever you've got set as the, as the value of the name property. Inverse property just basically says we want to do this the other way around. Um, so the thing that is in the collection of known by will be the subject, um, and it's an inverse property, and then uh, this will be the uh, object. In this case, what it's saying is this is an inverse property of a property that has already been defined in another interface. In this case, it's on the same interface, but it could be on a different interface. So it just knows that knows and known by are basically invert, uh, the inverse of each other. Uh, and there is a different kind of decoration that you can use when you want to have a property that is read in the reverse direction object, predicate, subject, um, but you're not defining the forward one anywhere in any of your interfaces. So you can model things pretty much how you would like. So, with those generated classes, uh, the, they all derive from a data object based class, um, and that data object is tracking uh, the list of quads, in this case it's triples plus the graph URI, uh, that are loaded for a particular entity at any, any given time. <coughs> By default, uh, we lazy load, so we only uh, start off with just knowing what the uh, resource uh, URI is, and then we'll, the first time we ask for a property, we grab all of the forward direction properties and inverse ones we just always lazy learn. Um, as we'll see in the, in the discussion on linked Sparkle, um, we can also just meet the loaded, uh, which just helps with performance. <coughs> as well as the data objects that are generated, there's a context object, and this is just tracking all of our changes. The nice thing about the uh, context objects is that we can track changes simply as triples or quads that we've added and quads that we're going to delete. And then when we do a save changes, we can just push all of those up to the server in a, in a single batch. So when we're saving uh, changes, there is actually two ways in which uh, um, we can do this, depending on whether you're using Brightstar or whether you're using the uh, entity framework part that we've developed uh, on top of the Spark endpoint. So you can do it either way, you can either use our data store or you can use any other um, data store that supports Spark Update. Um, if you're using our data store, then uh, you just basically push that list of changes up uh, you can also put a list of guard patterns, and we'll see why those become useful later on, but they basically say, don't execute this transaction if any of these statements are false. Um, with Sparkle Update, we just do a, a delete where and an insert where. Uh, we set them up in one operation, and we hope that your, in, your service implementation does that transactionally. Right start, we will do this transactionally. Your Sparkle endpoint mileage may vary. So some additional features that we added, so we've just got the you know, basic stuff done. Um, one of the nice things we can do is take any, uh, data, any data object that you've got uh, and we can typecast it. So we have uh, a method that basically allows you to tell this entity to become an entity of another type in your domain model. So you can actually move your resource from looking at it as one kind of thing to looking at it as another kind of thing, but keep all the changes that you've made to it and send them all up to the server uh, altogether. Um, there's fairly limited use cases for it, but sometimes it's nice in your domain model to be able to say, sometimes I want to treat a resource as being a person, and sometimes I want to treat them as being a customer, and I want to separate those two things out. Uh, we have support for optimistic locking if you're using Brightstar DB. Uh, this is based on adding an extra property to the RDF resource that just tracks its version number, uh, and then when we do the update, uh, one of the guard properties will say, don't act, execute this transaction if the version number has changed. Uh, we have support for composite keys, which is basically just a way of saying, rather than having a key property that is going to get automatically set by the entity framework, I want you to use these properties uh, and concatenate them together and use that as the natural key on the end of the URI. Uh, so you can generate nice hierarchical URIs, or you can uh, just take certain properties and use them to generate new URIs. Um, and then based on that, uh, we also have this uh, concept of uh, in, in quotes, scare quotes, unique identifiers, uh, where we say that we can generate the generated URIs that you get for these entities can be required to be unique across the type. Um, so because we're allowing this typecasting, we're allowing people to swap their entities from being a type person to type customer, we don't want to limit them to saying you can only have, ever have one type on this thing. So we say that a unique identifier is considered to be unique if there is no other uh, triple that also has the same uh, identifier and the same RDF type uh, property on it.
So the RDF data plane, what we found is that it can be useful and it can be especially useful for people who don't want to deal with RDF um, as a way of hiding it from them, but they're still using RDF. Uh, if you're on top of a, a bright star DB, then obviously you're using our data store, but you can basically do this against any Spark at any point um, that supports Spark graph data. Um, we found that it was re relatively easy to implement the basic data binding um, stuff, and I think that the approaches that we've taken should be extensible to non-dotnet languages, so part of our um, So, what we've covered so far are basic creation, update, and delete, but we haven't done query. That's where link to Sparkle comes in. So for those of you who haven't heard about link, link stands for Language Integrated Query, uh, and it is a common uh, language for data access in .NET. So you can actually write this into your C sharp code, into your EPU code. Um, it supports lots of different bindings to different data backends. Um, so you can write a link query that will run against ADO.NET, so go to a relational database, against XML documents that have been passed, against in memory collections, and with our extension, against Spark endpoints. Um, some nice things that Link does is basically Link is kind of, because it's built into the language and it's understood by the parser, um, it uses introspection. So it can actually provide you with IntelliSense so you know what to type next or just so you don't know what you're going to type next. So you get some more data completion. It's, it's kind of a nice, uh, nice way to, to use the query languages. So our implementation basically takes the Link query, um, parses it to get a query tree. Um, and then we walk query tree and generate some Sparkle expressions, wrap them up into select or construct as is appropriate, uh, and execute Spark query. And then we just take to find the results. Simple, right? Simple. So the way that it looks from a programmer's point of view is that they are basically dealing with um, collections on their context object. Um, so if I want to select a single uh, Oh, sorry, in this case I want to iterate over all of the members of a, of a collection, uh, then I would do something like uh, from p in context of dinners, select p. So iterate over everything that's in dinners and return them. Which gets converted into Sparkle, which is just select p where p is a, and then whatever our URIs. I, I, I've compressed my URIs to curious because you don't have room on slides otherwise, but it would be a full URI. So we can do things like selecting a property, as you would expect. So we want to say, uh, for uh, dinner num with the ID of one, uh, find all the RSVPs to the, to the dinner, and that basically gets turned into a, uh, a first selection that is just a type filter, and then uh, a property navigation. We're going through to find the attendees, and, and basically we export that variable, and they define that back out. So that's nice and easy. Uh, joins are similarly straightforward in Spark, we're just basically taking, uh, so in this case we're saying for all, for all of the dinners, find all the RSVPs and select the uh, emails of the attendees and just return the full list of all of the, attend, attend, all of the emails of all the RSVPs for all of the dinners. And it just becomes a, a bit more navigation um, and then a single projection of the final variable that we want to get, in this case the email. How do you do filters? Because Spark has support for filters, so you can do things like uh, find all the events that are happening after right now. It's um, <coughs> turned into a uh, navigation network with a filter, uh, filter tapped on the end, as you would expect. Um, one of the places where we're a little bit limited is Link basically allows you to use any method uh, from uh, any C sharp <laughs> uh, as part of the query, and obviously we can't do that because Spark can't do that. Um, but you find that the ADO.NET implementation can't do that either, and there's certain things that it'll turn up. So we've just implemented as many as we can actually directly map. So things like um, string operations have, the, have a direct mapping. Um, where they don't have a direct mapping, we can often turn them into a regular expression just using regex um, matches. The map operations, we can map all the Sparkle ones back to their um, equivalent in C sharp. Um, and we can also do uh, uh, containment operations using the Sparkle in. Um, so we've got actually quite a nice level of coverage, I think, for, for what we can do in terms of methods. Okay, so having got the basic thing in place, you'll notice that the queries that I was showing you are basically returning single properties. 
um, that gives you a problem for performance because uh, you'll end up getting all of the IDs of the things that you're interested in, but then as you iterate through, every time you hit one task for a property of it, you're going to have to go and do another round trip to the server. Um, so, uh, I basically had, had a long think about it, and this was my first attempt at uh, doing EVA loading, which is basically to make use of the subquery. So, this is the actual query down here that is generated from the link, and it's giving us one particular resource back. So I can wrap this up in, with another statement that basically finally says, find all of those triples, and then turn it into a graph, and send that graph back, and then I'll do some magic on the client side that will uh, um, create all the entities out of those triples. So, um, the reason we did it like this, rather than using, it, for those of you that are aware of Sparkle, we know that there's a uh, construct that you can use called describe, uh, where you can ask it to, rather than saying select S, you can say describe S, um, the reason we didn't use describe is because describe uh, is uh, deliberately left open what the server returns to you. So uh, you can't rely on it telling you everything that it knows about the S. This is the only way to force it to tell you everything that it knows about S. Okay, uh, I call it the naive approach because it has problems. Uh, first problem would be when you try to do anything in sorted order. Um, because graphs don't have a sorted order, a construct is just building you a graph. Um, so, one thing we did spot was that uh, all the backends that we were trying with serialize in the source order, um, but that's not really something you should be relying on. Um, and there's no way in a construct to basically insert anything that isn't really already part of your query. So, we can't say, you know, insert a number one for the first batch that you map into the construct template, insert number two, or something, stuff like that. That doesn't work. So, what we did instead is we came up with this. Which is, in the bit that I'm generating from the, from the link, as well as the actual thing that I want to return, I also project out the sort variables. Uh, and then from the thing that I want to return, I get all of its triples. But in the construct statement, I'm taking the sort variables and I'm also adding those into the graph. So now I've got a full resource, all of its triples, but I've got these extra triples in our own namespace that give me the sort value 0 and sort value 1. Which means that on the client, I can then go through and I can just find all of these, uh, these statements, sort them by the same sort order, um, because I already know that it's sort value 0, sort value 1. The only thing that the client keeps track of is when it sends the query, which ones are sending, which ones descending. Um, so it keeps track of that, and then it can just resort everything uh, on the client side. The nice thing you'll notice actually is that in here, we don't ask the server to do any sorting. There's no point. Because we're going to have to sort it all again on the client. So the server doesn't have to do anything in sort order, we just do it in sort order on the client. Of course, that kind of falls down when you want to do some paging. Um, because if you want to ask for a particular chunk of the results rather than all of the results, um, you are going to have to ask the server to do the sorting, otherwise, it's going to give you the wrong thing. So when we're doing a paging, we're, uh, if, we, if we need to do some sorting, we make sure that the sort uh, order is added and then we do that. But basically, the same, the same client side processing applies. But that falls down when you want to do distinct. Um, the problem being that once you ask for a distinct set of results, uh, you have a problem with us doing that projection inside the subquery because that is projecting not only the thing that we actually want to return that we want to be distinct, but also the two sort values, or multiple sort values, possibly. Uh, and if those have multiple possible bindings for the same S, uh, you end up with multiple supposedly distinct solutions that all return the same S. So uh, the solution we came up with was to, to basically uh, use an aggregation uh, and a group by. So we basically say, okay, we've got these two sort values, uh, value 0 and value 1. Uh, one's supposed to be in ascending order, one's in descending order. So we'll choose the highest of the uh, ascending order and the lowest of the descending order, uh, and then we'll make sure that we're basically ordering all of our results uh, in that order, grouped by the subject, or the resource that we're trying to return, the S, uh, and then select distinct where we're basically using the same values as we get here. So uh, the nice thing about this is for any given S, it will only ever return one row, and it will always return the row that is the, is the furthest through in the sort order. We could have done it the other way around, so it was always giving you one that would be the first in this order, we decided to do the, the last. 
That means how much time have I got left? I've got one minute. <laughs> okay, Spark Lens Rock. Yes, we've done it. Um, kind of. Um, please, please do have a look at uh, the stuff that we've done. Um, I haven't got time to go through all these things, but it's all in the paper, so yeah, read this as it goes through. So we get to the last <laughs> one. Well, small, we have a small amount of time, because you can eat this is some of your question time. You want to cover that. Okay, okay. Small amount. A small amount of time, okay, let's just talk a little bit. <laughs> so, we did it, right? And this is kind of how we did it. So, I think it's probably the best way to say it. So, OData is a really nice um, service for publishing for publishing data, in, again, in a closed world model. An OData server has a schema, and it only expresses data that is in that, in that schema. Um, but with that limitation, it's actually a very nice, uh, a very nice service. You can look at the OData spec, I recommend you have a, have a look at it. So we basically implemented, a, we, we like OData as a, as a data access uh, mechanism. Um, we don't like the fact that it's very closed, and we like Spark endpoints. So we basically implemented a proxy that you can put in front of a Sparkle endpoint that takes an OData request, converts it into a Sparkle request, takes a Sparkle result, and converts it into an OData result. In fact, the process that we use for that is remarkably like the data mining, because it's basically the same problem, uh, just in a service. Uh, one thing that we haven't done yet is uh, the moment you, can, you have to hand annotate your OData schema, uh, there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't have some automatic process that introspected the Sparkle endpoint worked out what all the types were, and generated them, and data scheme, so you can just press a button and go. Um, okay, now, that's, now let's come over and you can do any more question time. You can ask me questions about all of that. So, short conclusion. Um, I don't think RDF has to be hard for developers to use. I think it has a, a very bad reputation as being hard for, for, for ordinary developers. I mean, not, not a, we're, we're all developers, right? A lot of us are ordinary. Um, but it does have this, it does have this bad reputation. Um, I think that one of the reasons for that is it's very difficult for programmers coming from a, a traditional programming back, background to get their head around this difference, this open versus closed world. Uh, and bridging the gap really helps. Um, and as I would have shown if I had time to do both, this can apply both at the language level and at the protocol level. Um, but if you'd like to find out more, those are all the URLs that you need and the Twitter things that you Thank you. the actual uh, implementation itself, the data store, and that's available. Uh, and then there is a layer that we built around it that basically exposes that service as a REST, REST for service. <coughs> we have two client APIs, uh, well, we have one client API, but two implementations of it, one which talks to the REST for service over HTTP, and one which just goes directly to the, to the data store. So on the mobile phone, you would just use the direct to the data store one, but you can change that basically by changing your connection string. So it's all connection string. The APIs are exactly the exact same. Okay. So um, in, in terms of the use case, uh, what, what kind of a nap would benefit from this? this so um, apps that need to change their data during an update. So when you need to migrate data. So if you've got a SQLite database, which is a typical thing you'd have in a mobile application, and you want to go, if you want to upgrade your user from version 1.1 to version 2, if you've got a schema change that's involved there, you have to migrate the data. Um, then if you uh, bring out version 2.1 and you made another change, you have to migrate the data again, and you will have this data migration to you. Whereas, because everything is just in, in one store, and it's in an open world assumption store, you don't have that data migration uh, issue actually in the, in the database. You can just deal with that, uh, you know, do I have this property? You can deal with that in curve one. To deal with it as a data migration is here. Um, I think that's one of the big advantages. Um, the other is that we're, uh, we want to add in the ability to be able to, which we haven't done yet, we want to add in the ability to be able to syndicate your searches so you could do something that's local plus something that's remote and have it, the results merge uh, locally. So. Thank you. So, one more question? Okay. 
Thank you, Kat.